Referendum o členství Velké Británie v Evropské unii se blíží. V typicky britském počasí jsme se vydali za velvyslankyní Jan Thompson, aby nám o něm řekla několik slov. Um, we do have some um, rules that apply in terms of the campaign. Um, we have an elections watchdog, an independent body called the Electoral Commission, uh, which regulates how the campaign should be run. Um, it has a role in appointing lead campaigns for either side of the debate. Um, and uh, so the, the formal electoral uh, campaign period began on the 15th of April. Um, and those, the two lead campaigns have now been designated. Um, on the Remain side, that will be an organisation called Britain Stronger in Europe, which is backed by the British Prime Minister, David Cameron. Um, and on the Leave side, um, it's an organisation called Vote Leave. Um, so under our system, um, if you are designated as the lead campaign, you have access to um, broadcasting rights, for example, for broadcast to, to support your arguments. Uh, you have much higher spending limits. The lead campaigns can spend up to £7 million over the course of the campaign. Um, and they also receive some um, grant for some of their expenses. Um, so it's, it's obviously a, a of benefit to be designated as the lead campaign, but anyone can also campaign um, up to, and can spend money up to £10,000 in the course of the campaign, or if they want to exceed that limit, they can, can apply to spend more. It's been 40 years since the British public uh, last had a say on its membership of the European Union. I think people are very interested. Um, it's been a lively campaign. Um, David Cameron, um, although the British government's position is to, to support Britain's continued membership of the European Union, David Cameron suspended collective responsibility for his cabinet. Um, so members of the cabinet are able to campaign on either side of the debate. It's been a lively campaign. But I think in terms of the public, there's a real um, interest in having more information because people recognise that it's a really important decision and they feel they don't have enough information and they're really thirsty for more and more information to understand what, what might be the arguments for and against. Um, and the government has published a number of papers trying to provide more information, but obviously uh, both campaigns are putting out information and trying to, uh, to ensure that the public have as much information as they need to make an informed decision. Well, um, I mean, the, the government's focus is very much on campaigning for a Remain vote um, because the government believes that the UK is stronger and safer and better off in a reformed European Union. Um, stronger because it's the world's largest trading bloc um, and it's, you know, the government believes it's better to be on the inside of, of a powerful organisation like that. Um, helping to take the decisions that will will shape um, shape shape our future, um, safer because of the ability to work together with other countries in the European Union on cross border issues like crime or terrorism, um, and better off because of the access that membership of the European Union gives the UK to um, to a market of 500 million consumers um, and all the growth and jobs um, and investment opportunities that brings. Um, so that's the government's, what's the government's focused on. Um, in the uh, eventuality that there should be a vote to leave the European Union, um, there is a process set down under the European Union Treaty for what would need to happen yet next. Um, and a country that wanted to leave would need to inform the European Council um, of that decision. Um, and then that would kick off um, a process um, um, 
during which the country that wanted to leave and the rest of the European Union would need to agree arrangements uh, that would um, govern that country's departure from the Union. Um, and it, there's, there's a period set down in the European Union treaties of two years uh, for that to happen. It could be extended by mutual agreement. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to know because a country has never left the European Union, so it's all very hypothetical. Uh, but the British government has prepared um, some papers that look at different aspects of this. Um, for example, it, have, it prepared a paper that looked at different models for the relationship that the UK might have with um, the European Union. Um, it looked at uh, the, a, a model, it, it kind of, it, it mostly found there were three main models that could be followed. Um, and each of those would have some advantages and some disadvantages and some costs. It's very difficult to weigh up exactly costs and, and estimates would vary. Uh, but the, the British government's conclusion was that none of these were as positive as the current arrangement that the UK has with the European Union. David Cameron felt he achieved a really important agreement in February at the European Council um, and um, made, got, agreed a number of important um, arrangements, particularly in the area of protecting the rights of countries that are outside the Eurozone, which is obviously of interest both to the UK and to the Czech Republic, um, and making sure that decisions which affect countries outside the Eurozone are taken by all countries and not just by the countries inside the Eurozone. Um, also, um, arrangements in the area of competitiveness um, to ensure that the European Union presses ahead with free trade agreements with fast-growing parts of the world or developed economies um, and that um, the burden on business is reduced to the extent possible. Um, and that the single market is completed, particularly in services and digital and energy. Um, and also agreements in the area of sovereignty to make sure that um, groups of national parliaments coming together could block unwanted legislation coming from um, Brussels, if that was appropriate. Um, and also arrangements to tackle welfare abuse and clamp down on on um, unhelpful welfare arrangements. So there were a lot of important um, arrangements that were concluded in the deal that was reached at the February European Council. Um, that deal, the arrangement that was struck, is um, binding under international law and does have legal force. Um, and it would come into effect as soon as the UK voted to remain in the European Union. Um, and that agreement will be registered at the United Nations. This has happened before, for example, with the Danish protocol um, and other arrangements. So it will have legal force um, as soon as the UK votes to remain. Obviously, if the UK were to vote to leave the European Union, then that agreement would, would fall away. Um, I guess I, I suppose it's fair to say that the UK has been a force for good in many ways in the European Union. It's the second largest economy in the European Union and a major contributor to the EU's budget. Um, we're the only country that is meeting our commitments to spend 0.7% of our GDP on uh, development um, and 2% of our GDP on defence. So we're obviously quite a big player on in terms of EU security operations overseas um, and in terms of EU development assistance. Um, and I think we're a strong player diplomatically and a strong voice for um, for, for example, we've been a strong player on in making the case for sanctions against Russia uh, recently over recent behaviour um, and that sort of thing. So I think we're a, we're a big voice and a player at the table there in the EU. So from that point of view, I guess the, the EU would be weakened without the UK. But And, and that's certainly um, something that I hear other members of the European Union saying.